Uh, how's everyone doing this morning? You guys good? All right. Uh, yeah, I talked to Kathy earlier in the week, and she was planning to speak today, um, and she said, I am really heavily medicated, and I don't know if it would be a good idea. I was like, man, I could speak for you, but I would love to hear that, so um, hopefully she's there watching um, at home. Um, I am a Robert M. student pastor. He did that introduction right there, and uh, if I haven't met you, um, some of you guys are new. Uh, usually we're back there uh, on Sunday mornings with the students, and we have a good time. And we've been going through a series this month called Counterfeit, and what I'm going to do is uh, run through the first four weeks in just a couple of minutes. If you're thinking we're going to be talking about five weeks of material in one day, it's okay. We're going to breeze past a lot of it. But uh, the message that they're actually discussing in their small groups today that we did this past Wednesday, we're going to talk about that this morning. And so uh, for those that have students, car ride home. You guys are on the same page, so you got something to talk about over lunch. Um, we've been talking about the series Counterfeit, and uh, it's, it's talk about the idea of, of a counterfeit faith. And this is one of the things that we've, we address over the years uh, with the students, is that a lot of times what happens is they come to church, and they're Christians because their parents brought them here, and they kind of grow up with that idea, and they're just borrowing the religion of their parents, and they don't take the time to investigate the claims, to apply it to their lives, to do the things that would be necessary to make it something that they own, that's theirs, that's real, and so that as they grow into adults, it's not, it's not just something that you've been pretending for years, but it's actually a real faith. And so we talk about this idea of how do you move your faith from counterfeit to real? Like, how do you take that and make it something that could be a real and living faith? And, uh, and of course, starting off in the series, we talked about putting it into practice. Uh, Jesus puts it in this way. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. I think we've all seen enough like hurricane footage to understand the prospect of putting a house on the sand. I don't know if you guys have been out to like the Outer Banks, the Rodanthe area, where there's just like houses that are going to be gone in a few years. You can buy them for pretty cheap because you've only got like a two-year lease on that thing, but it's not smart to put houses on the beach, you know, close, but put some rocks so that can hold true. And this is Jesus talking about this is what happens when you hear the words, you know the words, but you don't actually practice the words. You don't apply them. You don't do them. It's not part of your behavior. It's just part of your knowledge. And that's part of what a not real faith is. Real faith is about doing, not just knowing. And this is the part um, we'll come back to in the later part of this message. But this is where I think it applies to a lot of us is there's a lot of things we know, but we don't do. Like, I'm sure everyone in this room probably knows, eat healthy and exercise more, right? Like, we know that. We know it. If you ask someone, be like, hey, what are some things you can do that are good for your health? Uh, eat healthy foods, exercise more. What did you do yesterday? I went to the drive-thru, I sat on the couch, you know? It's, I know it, but do I do it? I didn't do that, actually, but... Um, but you know it, but you didn't actually do it. Sorry, I hear my wife say something right down here, and I, it's throwing me off. Um, she's like, not too far from the truth. James says it like this. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. And this is still falling at lines of doing it. Do it. Uh, a real faith is practice. And we established that idea, and so I'm going to establish that here with you guys. Like I said, we're going to catch up with five weeks. That was week one. Week two, we kept going to this idea of what a real faith looks like and how you can build on it, how you can grow it, how you can develop it and make it part of your life. And part of the way you put it in practice, part of the way that you actually live the lifestyle that you claim to have, that you can accomplish these things that you know you should do, is the company that you keep. Walk with the wise and you become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. I know parents, you'd be like, amen, I tell them that all the time, is you want to know who those friends are. You know the friends, you're like, stay away from them, because they're dumb, and they're going to make you dumber, and that's true. It happens. You can see it and play, and we've all done it in our lives. We know who that friend was who always had bad ideas, you know. 
they were fun to hang around, but you end up blowing something up and someone gets hurt, and then it was a bad day or a good day. It was memories. Uh, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. This is, this is going on. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We went into a verse. We talked about how this is uh, it's scriptural, but it's also smart. Like some of these things that, that the Bible teaches you, it's not just because it makes you a better Christian or, or because God said to do it. It's a good way to live your life. And this is one of those things that's just a good thing to who you surround yourself with. Who do you go to for advice and where does that advice coming from? Because it's amazing sometimes people be like, hey, I talked to so-and-so and this is what they told me. You're like, well, how did they know that? Well, they Googled it. You know, that's just first result must be true. Real faith grows with other people. Rob gave the invite to small groups. This applies to us. If you're not connected to a small group, if you just kind of see everyone for a few minutes before and after service and that's the only interaction you have here, get connected. Find some people that you can grow with. Don't just surround yourself with church people. I don't do that either. That's weird. But, uh, but just make sure that you have some people that can give you godly advice that you can, that you can go to and say, hey, I need prayer for this. I need someone to, uh, to correct me when I'm wrong and hold me accountable in different areas. Real faith grows with other people. And then week three, we went into this idea that God wants to use you, and when his purpose is being lived out in your life, it, it opens up your eyes to, to how real God is when you can just experience it firsthand. You'll never get over what God does through you was our bottom line for that week. And we encourage people to be part of something bigger than yourself. Be part of something bigger than yourself. I think that's one of those areas that uh, we, we always be like, come on, God, bless what I'm doing, bless what I'm doing, you know, leave me somewhere. But there's so many things God's already blessed that you can become part of. And then God can use turning points to grow your faith week four. This is when big moments happen, and they do happen in all of our lives. And some of them are good, some of them are tragic. But who do you become on the other side of that? Do you trust God to take you through it? Do you trust God to uh, build you when you come out the other side or the experience that you have. And that brings us up to week five. See, I told you that wasn't going to be too long, so don't worry. Um, We're we're caught up with where we were this past Wednesday. Of course, I did not do it that quickly back then. Uh, It's a little bit different given a message in 12.1. You guys are not, like, I haven't seen a single hand go up just to interject with a story from today. So um, if you want to, if at some point you're just like, hey, that reminds me of what happened in class this afternoon, you know, then you can. Um, I may or may not call on you depending on how good your first response is. Um, also, I don't see y'all gathered around cell phones. I will take that cell phone. If you distract your neighbor with your cell phone, I will send Pastor Rob to come grab it from you, and you'll get it back after service, okay? So just want to make sure we're understood on the same page. Yeah, we have to do that every once in a while next door. Um, this is different. So This week, talking about a real faith, not a counterfeit faith, something that you have that, that changes who you are. I think a lot of times we kind of can fall into, I'm a Christian, and you'd be like, why? And it may involve the practice of our daily lives, but if we're going to be honest with ourselves, it's became something a little bit less real in our lives over time. And maybe we just need to reclaim that. Real faith is an everyday faith, not just on Sundays. If, if, if you're just like, hey, I checked the box Christian on all of those things they ask because I'm here on Sundays. I hear a message. I'm like, that's cool. I like that. And then I'll be back next week or the week after. That is some of our experience with it. But I want to go beyond that. Because the success in our lives, to make something real, to make something life-changing, it has to be practiced on a more consistent basis. Some of you guys may have a, a membership to a gym that's just draining from your bank account each month because you got at the beginning of the year and you're like, I'm going to do this this year, and you've been twice, and you have excuses on why you haven't been back. You know, you went the one time, and you just, you know, did your reps, and then you got home and looked and thought, don't look different, doesn't work. What's the point? It takes habits habits 
You know, students, they need good study habits to really develop. For you, maybe it's a good work habit. If you're consistently late, if you're habitually late every day for work, it'll be noticed. Yeah, Joseph is like, yeah, me, look at this. You could have gone straight down that hallway. You didn't have to come through the sanctuary. <laughs> Where is everybody? He's confused. He saw me up there, and he's like, he, they're in here, and they're not. Um, eating habits, exercise habits, these things, uh, you do them consistently, you build them, they become who you are. We have bad habits. We have those too. I have no fingernails, all right? You can figure out how that happens. I've spent it since a kid. I've tried to stop. It doesn't. It just ends up biting them off, and it's, it's horrible. But our habits can define us. And so when we're talking about this idea of faith and what it can do for us, with us, and this life-changing aspect of it, I want to talk about some habits. See, God wants a relationship with us. I believe this to be true. I believe this to be for everyone here. Uh, I, I heard that all growing up, but I didn't understand it fully until I experienced it and what that means. To understand that the God of the universe had sent his son and like, yeah, I know John 3.16, God so loved us that he gave his only son, but yeah, but it's more than that because he wants a response from us. He wants your soul to connect to his, to seek his, and we can do this. Our relationship can grow. Our relationship can grow stronger with the God of the universe. And we do this through habits. I, I'm married, I've been married for... <laughs> A long time now, um, very happy with my wife. Uh, she's cool, I make jokes, but um, I'm not just saying that because she's in here, all right? Um, but we have a very habitual relationship. If you've been married for a while, you know over time that you start to develop these habits in your relationship, and if you start to break those habits, it can throw things out of whack. Like, I have a habit of I go home every night. Like, that's where I stay. And if I just didn't do that one night, it would seem very, very weird, you know, like, She'd pull up to find a friend and be like, where are you? Thought we had this understanding of what our relationship was. We eat our meals together, watch the same thing. We want to eat our meals together. It becomes habitual and it, it builds a relationship. We grow to know each other. And it's the same thing with God. You, you may have your friends that you've been close to that you have those same habits. And then if you break that, it feels like something's wrong in the relationship. And with God, it's, it's the same thing. that It's not just that we know he's there. It's not just that we've learned something about him. I think a lot of times we can stop right there. We can be like, hey, look, I, I believe there's a God. And I believe that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. I believe these things to be true. And I have a belief in this. It's my Christian belief. And then we stop at that point. And so what I, I want to call, if you feel like there's still something empty after that point, if you still feel like, hey, you know what, like, like maybe it's not just about the belief, but maybe the belief should push me into action. Maybe that's what's next for me, is that I actually take steps towards God. Well, this is for you, and this is what I believe will help that. I want to uh, go into scripture this morning. I know we've run through some, but I want to dive into this one today as we talk about our, our main topic, is topic of, of growing in our faith. And I want to hit up Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says it like this, he says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. This is, this is a writer saying, you could, I, I can hear a little bit of frustration in this, right? Like, you can sometimes tell when you, someone's giving you a text message, you look at it and you're like, man, watch your tone, right? Like, you can kind of hear this, it's just like, hey, look, some of you guys, you should be a lot further along than you are. 
Like, you, you're still just needing someone else to tell you what to do. You're still requiring someone else to break it down for you, someone else to give you the instructions. You're still on milk, and you should have been weaned by now. You should be feeding yourselves, but you're not. I, uh, just as an illustration, okay, just for one thing real quick. Uh, Pastor Rob did this message years ago, and we recorded this video of him dressed like a baby, eating baby food and spitting it out for this very topic. I could have showed that this morning. I really could have. I chose not to. I didn't think I could recover afterwards, right? It's, those who've been here for a while, you know what I'm talking about. All right, um, but instead I grabbed this baby bottle, which I don't think I've held ever in my life. <laughs> this is the first time. Got to the dollar store. She's like, time to feed the baby. I'm like, nope, for adults. But um, it was sitting back there this morning, and Tiffany came in and was very confused by it. I don't know why. Why is it weird for an adult man to have a baby bottle if he doesn't have a baby? I like milk. It's confusing, I know. I'm not going to drink out of it. I don't think that would go right, and y'all have phones now. Anyway, no one's taking a picture of that. But this is the idea, is that we, we still, a lot of people, been in the faith for a long time, we understand, you can tell this thing keeps falling off my ear, uh, but we're still on the bottle. We still need our bottle. We need to come, Pastor Rob, you need to give us our bottle every Sunday. We'll put on our, our little aprons, because we may spit up a little bit if we don't like it, if we're not ready for it, but you've got to feed it to us. Give us the bottle. We need our milk. We haven't moved on to solid food yet. And this is a problem because if you knew someone, an adult, who's still doing that, they'd be probably malnourished if they haven't moved on to solid food. There's so many things. I don't understand the science of, of when people go from solid foods and stuff. I don't know. I know it happens at some point. I did it. We all did it. But you grow and you get to the point where you're like, hey, you should be moving on to solid foods now and then you get those teeth in, you got some stuff you can chew, and then at some point, kid says they want to order a steak. And you get them a steak, and they put ketchup on it, and you're like, what's wrong with you? But it's part of the growing process. And, and we know that. And so this writer's saying, like, now think of that and apply it to your spiritual self. Apply it to your spiritual self. Have you moved on beyond the bottle? I take water breaks quite frequently. I apologize. I had something, and I'm like, I don't need to write it in my notes because I'm going to remember that at that point. And I remember that I was supposed to remember it. Man, I've got to write it down. That's bad habits is what that is, all right? Um, habits are about repeatedly practicing something. Making it part of your life, doing it on the daily. If it's important, it'll be consistent. And when it comes to our faith, we need to learn to feed ourselves and become self-sufficient. We need to learn to feed ourselves and become self-sufficient. And, and I want to make sure that we make a clarification on what that means to move beyond the bottle and to get the solid foods because um, a lot of people they kind of get confused by it, and they're just like, oh yeah, I, I, I'm doing a Bible study on the book of Numbers, going to memorize the whole thing. I'm really on solid food now. I'm like, no, come on now. That's not what we're talking about right here, because we're talking about getting beyond understanding and knowledge and putting it into practice and doing it. This is exactly how Jesus put it in his words. This is what James said, is that real faith and real Christianity and real religion goes beyond the knowledge, and it goes into action. You know something, you believe something to be true, and that belief spurs you into action. If I told you right now, and this is not true, but if I said, the building is on fire, right? And I told you it's not true, you don't believe it to be true, and therefore you sit where you're at. But if smoke started billowing out the doorways, and I said, oh my, the building is on fire, you would get up and you would leave. Suddenly, your belief moves you into action, and that's how it is with so much of our life, is what we believe to be true, what we really believe to be true. 
defines what we do. And so, when we learn to feed ourselves, it's going beyond just knowing. How do we do that? How do we do that? I have no idea. All right, let's go home. Not, anyway, that's what we're going to talk about uh, this next point, is how we actually do that, how we put it into practice. I always like to have like a do this portion in the message. So it's, it's usually how we break down a 12-1. It's kind of like, hey, let's talk about a topic and get introduced to it and tell a story or so. And then, and then it becomes this part where we say, this is the truth of God's word and what it says about our lives. But then there comes this application part, and it's like, all right, we know that. This is the part where you get to do it. This is the part where knowing God's word changes the way that you act. This is the part where it comes into practice and it becomes part of who you are. When I was probably about six years old, however old this tall is, I don't know. Um, for some people, that's like four, but for me, it was older. Uh, my mother, one day, she, she brought me into our basement, let's call it a laundry room, um, but she took me over and she showed me the washing machine and she put this step stool in front of it. And she's like, I'm going to show you how to wash, bless you, how to wash your clothes, you know, you're going to climb up this step stool and you're going to load the laundry in here to this line, don't cram it in there, and then you're going to put this thing on top, you put the laundry detergent in there, you turn the knob, push the button, some of you guys are like, is this how it happens? Anyway, um, and then it will run for this long, it'll make a buzzer sound, you move it to the dryer, and so I, wa I was six, and, and I, was, I was excited, all right? I was like trying to get to the bottom to get the socks, and I'm like, them out eventually, you know, like doing my own laundry. It was fun. I did not know, but from that point on, I always did my own laundry. Like once you learned how to do it, why is mama going to do it again, right? And so at six years old until, until I got married, I did my own laundry the entire, but got married. And that first time we were in an apartment, married life, and my wife was trying to figure out how to do laundry. <laughs> she's, she's like, I've never done this before in my entire life. I'm like, what are you talking about? I thought this was something that everyone did. I thought that every parent walked their kid. I had done my laundry since I was a little child. You should try this. If your kids are like six or so, you can convince them that everyone has to do this, and you're off the hook. But, and so I told her, I was like, this is how we do laundry. But I haven't done it since. Um, but it's this idea of becoming self-sufficient, to, to understand something, to put it into practice, to do it. And then, once you do that, you become teachers and you teach others to do the same. This is what they said, like, at this point, you should be teachers by now, but you still require other teachers to teach you. We can learn to feed ourselves. We can learn to go to God's word to learn ourselves, to, to digest it, to put it into practice, and to build ourselves stronger. A real faith is an everyday faith. It's not a put on, it's who you are. It's not just a Sunday morning thing, or a Tuesday night, or whenever it is that you show up around the Bible study, your small group or so, and then the rest of it, you're just like, all right, I hope I hear enough of God's word in those times, and we have enough worship and do the stuff to get me through until the next week. I'm going to worship extra hard because I'm missing next Sunday, you know, like it's, it becomes an everyday thing that you do. And there's so many different ways that you can do this, that you can build your relationship with God, that you can take steps towards him to put your faith into practice. Uh, one, we do this from hearing from God. We do this from hearing from God, and, and this, this really, it, take some effort on our part. We, we say habits because it's something you need to put into practice, but you know, you, you get into God's word and you don't just kind of like read it, read it, done. God, what are you trying to say to me? God, I, I'm going to allow other messages to speak to me. I'm, I'm going mean, to, we're, we're bombarded by messaging constantly. Like, it is one of those things that throughout the entire week, so many different ways that you can hear messaging. 
And most of it is horrible. Most of it's horrible. Like, it used to be that every once in a while, a tragedy or something bad would happen in your life or your neighborhood or your city, and you would deal with it. And now we have the news, and the news can tell us about every bad thing that happens anywhere all the time. <laughs> so that way we can just be like, you know what I need is uh, like fear nonstop. Let's just load ourselves full of that and see how we live our lives. And so... I'm talking about getting beyond that, saying, God, what do you want to speak to me? What is your message? What are you trying to instruct of me? And, and I'm going to make that something that I'm going to listen to, that I'm going to hear, and I'm going to apply to my life. Hearing from God. I almost just took the bottle instead of the water. Hearing from God. I, I used to hear this. Some of you, if you're new to this, I would hear... People talk about, like, I really feel like God's telling me, and I'm, like, confused by that because I thought that they literally meant they heard, like, an audible voice of God. That's what I thought. I thought they'd go to pray, and then while they were praying, God would be like, give them $100, and they'd be like, all right, God, God told me to give this to you, but that's not what it is. That's not what it is. It takes time of listening, allowing God to guide your heart and to move you where he wants you. Not just throwing it out to God and be like, hey God, do something, but being like, God, if you want to use me in some sort of way and I want you to use me in some sort of way, just guide me in the right place. Show me what you want me to do. I'll listen. Hearing from God. This is, like I said, one of those things that once you start to put into practice, it makes it so real when you allow God to move you into a place and, and there's been times where I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. I just felt led to. And then the person tells you, said, I was praying for this. I was asking God for this. And he used you to meet that need. God worked through you to reach me. That's real faith. Hearing from God. Uh, praying to God. Your prayer life says so much about your spiritual health. It really does. This is number one thing. People say, hey, man, I'm feeling empty. I'm feeling detached. I'm feeling away from God. I feel like things aren't what they were. I'm having really difficulties. How is your prayer life? I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have a prayer life. <laughs> well, we found out one of the problems. Talking to God. Talking to God. If, if I just stopped talking to my wife, things wouldn't be good, you know? That's usually like we're in a fight. You just like kind of stop talking for a little bit and it gets awkward. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a good relationship just to not speak to the other person. I've had those moments where I'm like, I haven't talked to my mom in two weeks and this is, makes me a horrible son. Like, and I'm like, she hasn't called me in two weeks either, so what's going on? <laughs> but you understand when it comes to a relationship, you got to talk. Praying to God, I know it can be awkward. I'm not going to pretend like it's not. I'm not going to tell you, be like, hey, you start talking to God, you're going to hear from him immediately, everything's going to be magical. It's not. There's some points where at first you need to be like, all right, I'm going to talk to God, and it's going to be a little awkward. But you do it, you start to open up, and then you also ask God to move you You're hearing from God, you're talking to God. There's this part where you're talking about God. It just becomes more than something that's like, oh, well, you know, my faith is personal, so I just keep it to myself and don't really want to talk to anybody else about what's going on. Now, I, I talked about that being in community with people. And this is one of those things where there's, there's a realness that comes from being in community and sharing faith with others as you grow. There, there's people here today that, you know, you may be in a place that God wants you to share that with someone else to give them encouragement. And someone else is in need of that encouragement. Talking about God, because we talk about what we care about. We do. We do. We, we get excited for something or something happens that we want to share it with people. We want to tell them and express it. I could if you're a big sports fan of a certain team, I could probably pick out your team if you've been here for a while. I've heard about it. 
I know things about people. I'm not going to call them out. Like, we know Rob with his Lord of the Rings. Come on now. Like, he talks about it. And so, what you care about, you share. Don't be afraid to talk about God with other people because even some of the ones that you may say, like, oh, well, they don't want to hear about this. And don't push religion down someone's throat. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm talking about a true, genuine share of what's happening in your life. And then living for God. What does that mean? I used to hear that. Living for God. Living for God. And it means kind of exactly what it says, that your life that he gave you, you woke up this morning with life and breath in your lungs, and you say, I didn't do this. <laughs> God made me for some sort of reason. I understand that to be true. And so I'm going to live this life for him. And whatever it is that I'm doing, you know, if I have this job and, and it's a, a tedious task or whatever, I'm still going to do it as an act of worship. God gave me that job. I'm going to live every single thing and do everything I can as an act of worship for him. I'm going to live out my life, and even if it doesn't seem like it's part of my faith, even if it doesn't seem like it should be part of my religion, it's going to become part of my religion because I'm going to do it for God as an act of worship. You start to apply that and start to see that Christianity is not contained to inside the church. It's not contained to church things. God put life in you, and he wants you to live it in a way that shines light into darkness. Living for God is a way that your real faith becomes an everyday faith. If you've seen me up here before, you know that I don't know how to close messages. Usually I just, next door, we reach a point of frustration. And, no, I'm just joking. No, no. <laughs> But uh, our, our bottom line for today, and this is the bottom line they're doing, is real faith is everyday faith. If, if you're a parent, you have a student, uh, this, is, this is one of those things that if you think for some reason that you could bring them to just drop them off in 12-1 and they're going to get enough of Jesus to sustain them and, and build their faith, it's probably not going to happen. Like, you, you got to be doing this on the daily. You got to help reinforce and, and, and share this with them and help develop spiritual habits the same way we do with their eating habits, their study habits, their exercise habits. It's, it's more than just what happens here on Sunday. And if you're here and you've been coming to church and you're checking this out, uh, I want to make sure a couple things are clear. Uh, one, if you're new to this, uh, the bottle is perfectly fine. No one ever smacks a bottle out of a baby's mouth and says, like, eat a steak, what's wrong, grow up, you know? I would say no one. Someone's probably done that, but... They're crazy, all right? You wouldn't do that if you're normal. It's okay. But then at some point, you've seen like the five or six-year-old with the pacifier, and you're just like, come on now. At some point, you got to get beyond, you got to fix that. They should grow up. And so if you're here and you're thinking like, all right, I feel like I've gotten to a point where I'm digesting this. I'm doing what's needed. I need to take a next step. Pastor Rob put the invitation out there. Whatever your next step is, let's do it. If it's getting plugged into a small group, if it's, if it's serving, if, if it's your time to be a teacher, if you've, if you've been learning this for a while and you've put it into practice and you could share that with other people and help guide them along, let's do it. It's not about knowing. It's about doing. Christianity is very simple to understand. It really is. Anyone who tells you otherwise, they've overly complicated. It's very simple to understand. It is super difficult to put into practice. And so that's why we come together to help encourage each other and to partner together and to do it. We're going to pray. And uh, I'm going to pray for you, but we're going to pray together because this is for all of us. No one in here is perfect. I'm not perfect. Rob's not perfect. No one is. All right, I could tell you who's the closest, but I'm not going to do that anyway. Never mind. Um, it's my wife, obviously. <laughs> uh, but we're going to pray, and uh, as we do, and we talk to God together, just ask God, God, what do you have next for me? Where, what's my next step? And be willing to take it. Let's pray.
God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for this day that we have, that you've made, and that that we get to be a part of. God, I thank you that we could come to this place together. We can talk about these things of you and what you have for us. God, the truth of your word, and God, I ask that you would help us to put into practice more consistently than we do, to develop stronger spiritual habits, to to develop a stronger relationship with you, God, that you that. It wouldn't just be what we know, but what we do. Real faith, put into practice every day, living for you. God, I ask that you'd help guide us in our next step, uh, whatever that may be for, for those that are new to the faith or those who feel like they've become stagnant. God, you'd speak to us, you'd lead us into that, and that you would give us the courage to take it. God, empower us with your spirit, change us with your love. Make us more like you every day. God, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.